Our next speaker, as well as running marathons, uh, is a professor of chemistry and chemical biology at Harvard, working on problems intersecting chemistry, physics, and computer science. And in 2010, he was listed in MIT's Top Innovators Under 35. So please welcome Alan Aspiro Guzik from the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Well, today I'm going to talk to you about how can we change the way we think about materials and chemicals. Uh, I am moving to Canada, a very nice country. So, the first thing that I want to say is that we're facing several challenges. Okay? If you look at the 21st century challenges, of the 32 listed, at least the ones I'm listing there have something to do with materials and molecules. We heard a lot about healthcare, uh, but also plastic pollution in the oceans and energy have to do with materials. So the question is, how long does it take to discover a material? Does anybody have any idea what is the typical time to actually come up with an idea for a material and actually commercialization? 10 to 20 years, OK? So if I have an idea now, I'm 42. At 62, that idea will make it to market. It's kind of depressing. Maybe I will have Alzheimer's by then, you know? So um, another number. How many people know how many atoms are in the visible universe? 10 to the how many? Why don't you guess, Kausa? 10 to the 50, you're off by 32 orders of magnitude only. So that's 10 to the 82. Just to think about that number is the number of all atoms that we could see with a telescope, right? So now the question is, if we took those atoms and we did Lego and we started making molecules, how many molecules do you think we can make, Kelsar? Oh <laughs> a lot more than that. A lot more than that. Well, you, are, you know, within 120 orders of magnitude, it's about 10 to the 60 to 10 to the 180 possible molecules we can make. And the solutions to those problems I told you about lie in that vast chemical space. And it is the mission of my laboratory to understand that chemical space. Where I cannot compute it all, I cannot explore it all, I cannot go around quickly in that space. And even if I do, it might take 20 years to commercialize whatever I discover. So those are the challenges that my research group and others around the world in the field of chemistry are trying to solve, you know, because we don't have time, especially in energy, to come up with these solutions. So, that unprecedented speed of exploration of chemical space requires new tools and new thinking about how chemistry looks like. If you think of the chemical laboratory of the 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, and 19th, 20th century, you will see a chemist shaking something while they're listening to Spotify, right? Nothing changes very much, you know, like people are doing things by hand, so we have to think about how to do it. So I wish that material space was like a cornucopia and I could just reach into it and find a molecule or a material that is good for something, right? Turns out it's the opposite. It's an inverted cornucopia, right? Where we actually have to go from 10 to the 60, which is roughly the size of chemical space very conservatively, to about a million molecules that I can calculate with quantum chemistry calculations, to the biggest problem that I face, or I think our field faces, the only the fact that even if I predict those molecules, a human takes about six months of time to actually make one. And then I go and test it, and it's just not gonna work. Okay, so it costs us a lot of money and a lot of time to make a molecule. Okay, so this is the issue in terms of materials and, uh, and the, the material space. And this is the reason why it takes a lot of time to think about new technologies for solar cells or new technologies for batteries or new technologies for, for medicines. You know, when we had a really good US president in the United States, President Obama launched the Materials Genome Initiative. Okay, this is an initiative to think about how computers, experiment, and data can get together and accelerate materials discovery. It was successful, but unfortunately, had a lot of emphasis on data and computation and not too much on experimental tools. And I was a very early uh, proponent of this and worked on it. Uh, and, and let me tell you how it works a little bit, OK? So just on this vast area of materials, actually, at the end of this talk, I'll tell you a very big breakthrough that just happened at MIT. Um, you can see here uh, different classes. I have worked myself in solar energy and batteries and making solar cells out of plastic and organic batteries. Because I have very little time, I'm going to tell you only about batteries and how we use our technology to actually accelerate battery discovery. Okay? So I was in Ecuador. In this conference, everybody is talking about Africa and so on. Well, I'm Latin American. I'm telling you about Ecuador. The island of San Cristobal uses 50% of the electricity from these three windmills. 20,000 people use electricity from these three windmills. I'm worried because one-sixth of the population might not get electricity because look at that lazy windmill over there. right? <laughs> That is the biggest problem of intermittency, okay? If we want to have a world with 100% renewables, we have to crack the problem of large-scale energy storage 
And humanity has not scaled, stored energy at a global scale ever. It's not like we can actually store the sunlight now in here in Oslo and save it for the winter to power this country when there's no sunlight or there's no wind. So large-scale energy storage is a big problem, and we're not going to solve it with the same type of technology that we use for our batteries, for our cell phones, or our laptops. Metals are too expensive. So this is what my, my a very good president has to say about this. Uh, and it's a company that provides multi-megawatt energy storage solutions uh, using, and I have no idea what this is, <laughs> vanadium redox fuel cells. That's one of the coolest things I've ever said out loud. I miss this guy. Uh, okay, so, so Obama is telling us, uh, yeah, All right, thank you that you miss him too. Uh, he's telling us everything amazing, but he's saying something that is not true. Okay, so even Obama can say some things that are not true. There's not enough vanadium in the crust of the air to store not even a fraction of all the energy we need to store as a humanity. Right? So that's where we came in. We said, can we think outside of the box? How many molecules are there? 10 to the 60 to 10 to the 180. Can we find there an alternative for storing energy without metals? Because metals are very expensive. And this is us thinking about it there in Harvard. Our energy storage efforts. Uh, and we came up with these organic flow batteries. Let me tell you what they are. Wind turbines and solar panels are great sources of clean energy. But what happens if it's calm or cloudy? Flow batteries store power in liquid tanks. The bigger the tanks, the more energy they can store. Here's how they work. Two solutions, one negative, one positive, are pumped into the battery. The energy source charges the battery, pulling electrons from the positive solution, a process called oxidation, and pushing them into the negative solution, a process called reduction. When the battery turns on, the electron flow reverses, and it generates an electric current. Using non-toxic organic chemistry, Harvard researchers are building safer, cheaper flow batteries, moving us one step closer to a bright future lit by clean energy. That music always makes me feel happy at the end. Uh, this is how they look, okay? This is how flow battery connected to a solar panel. Unfortunately, the company that you see there, Enervolt, basically collapsed. Why? They're using chromium for the technology. So you have to go organic. So let me tell you the, the molecule that we, what we discovered, we used the materials genome approach. We actually went ahead and calculated 10,000 quinones, in, uh, 10,000 molecules in about uh, you know, two or three months, synthesized and tested it, worked together with experimentalists. Multidisciplinary science is extremely important. You have to work with computational people, chemists, experimentalists, all together. And these multidisciplinary teams is what actually advances science. And we found this molecule, antraquinone disulfonate, uh, generation one, but still the cheapest battery molecule in the world. Okay? It basically is better than vanadium at all its characteristics, and it fulfills one of, the, one of the sides of the battery. We also call it Jesus Christ quinone for its looks. Okay, so how many of you know what is a quinone? Let me tell you a little about quinones. Uh, we were inspired by biology. Plants and our bodies use quinones to transfer electrons, so we thought maybe biology can help us understand uh, you know, um, finding the chemical space variants of the quinones, right? Also, you guys might have eaten a rhubarb cake, and uh, also rind, the molecule in the rhubarb cake, is actually antibacterial. And if you want to actually mate with female cockroaches, you can actually just douse yourself with Blattella quinone, you know, which is also a pheromone. My genes are also, uh, you know, uh, dyed with quinone dyes. So quinones are everywhere. They're industrial compounds. They're very easy to obtain from oil. And that was one of the ideas, I think, out of the box, but the issue is that we have screened roughly two million molecules with the computer and maybe made about a hundred, okay? And tested them, and many of them don't work. So we still don't have a solution for the other side of the tank. I'm showing you one side of the tank that has our antiquinyl disulfonate. The other one in this old paper of ours, old by, by, by about four years ago, uh, still has bromine. We still don't have a very good molecule for the other side, okay? So we're still working on trying to find what is gonna be the molecule for the other side. So for that, we develop different tools. For example, how many of you have used Tinder? Excellent. It's always a few people that admit. Uh, <laughs> so we actually developed a tool called Molecular Tinder to actually allow our experimentalists to help us pick those molecules. So this is our database. And we had a big, a big contribution that Tinder has to pay me royalties on. We added the so-so button. It's that orange button over there, which I think is usually what happens. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So, but that really allows us to actually accelerate the discovery of materials and actually um, 
move forward. So this is how modern chemistry looks like. Modern chemistry uses neural networks, screening engines, supercomputers, humans, all together. Okay, and, that, and you know, this allows us to suggest uh, new compounds, and as you can see, then supercomputers and artificial intelligence are extremely important. But this is a piece that's missing. We also need robots. We need to accelerate the synthesis of the compounds, right? And this is where a phone call I got from the Mexican government uh, a couple years ago was transformational in my life. They wanted me to write Mexico's mission for something called Mission Innovation. How many of you have heard about Mission Innovation? Almost nobody. Mission Innovation is the world's effort under the Paris Agreement to double the clean energy research in the planet from $15 billion to $30 billion over five years. We're already on, this, on the second year, and about two years ago, the world wanted to find seven projects to actually go around. So Mexico calls me, a typical Mexican style, they tell me, can you write Mexico's vision for this? By when? By Monday. I'm like, okay, <laughs> yes, I'll do it. Uh, and actually, we won one of the projects, and this, this project is Innovation Challenge 6, where m the proposal I made is, okay, we know how to do Matias genome, we know how to pr produce these molecules very quickly, but now the bottleneck is making them, testing them. Okay, so can we really accelerate the Matias platform that takes about 10 years? And we said, okay, let's just bring it on. Let's robotize the chemical laboratory. Let's just change how the chemical laboratory looks like. This has been done in other fields like biology, right? Can we actually learn from the biologists and actually make materials in a very smart way? So if you close the loop and take rapid feedback from what the robotic testing is doing, and my new laboratory at Toronto, I was telling you moving to Toronto, will be the, one of the first fully robotized platform chemical laboratories from beginning to end, right? Um, so we believe uh, in, in, in the mission innovation that the materials genome has to be expanded to, to really think about robotics, to think about the idea of the self-driving laboratory, a laboratory where you set up some experiments at night, you come back, you help the computer, the human and the computer work together, and then discover molecules. Is it possible? Well, let's just look at the cost of sequencing a human genome, okay? It's on the hundreds of dollars now, and it used to be a hundred million dollars for a single genome. If you plot Moore's law, which is just exponential growth, we have had more than that. We have actually gone faster than Moore's law, and now we're talking about $1,000, $100 or so for sequencing a genome. So if the biologists can do it, how come the chemists and the physicists cannot do it? This is a challenge for us, right? We have to, we're 20 years behind them, but we actually have to do it. So this is, this is the mission that I'm, is driving me for the next decade, to actually transform the way we think about this so we can have new materials for clean energy. So how can we do it? Okay, to achieve exponential efficiency growth, we have to think modularly. Marty Work from Urbana Champaign, which actually I had to fly today to meet tomorrow, he's coming to Harvard to work with me, and I are thinking a lot about the fact that maybe we cannot make all the 10 to the 60 molecules, but for example, Marty has shown with, an, with an ol only 1,500 fragments, you can make 60 to 70% of all the natural products, which contain many drugs, many interesting compounds for health. So I'm fine with only making 60 to 70% if I have a robot that can synthesize with 1,500 fragments. So we're working with him to develop the next generation robot to actually achieve this goal of modularity for molecules. And this is how these chemical robots look like. They are pumps that connect to filtration machines and heaters. They look very primitive, like the early computers of the, of the 19th century. So I like to call these things matter computers. In a recent report of Mission Innovation, I said, we really have to think of matter as registers that we process with gates, which are basically chemical reactions, to actually transform the way we actually make materials. Okay, so that's the, the first machine. I asked Marty, how is it called? He calls it the machine, okay? So we also have to come up with a better name than the machine. Uh, so this is what we're doing in collaboration with Jason Hine at the University of British Columbia in this Pan-Canadian initiative, actually funded by the, by the Natural Resources Canada. Uh, very soon, we're working on uh, this idea of, okay, meta laboratories. Here is software at Harvard, running a robot in Vancouver, and the first time we set up this experiment, the robot found a solution to the problem, which was injection into an HPLC machine, whatever that means, uh, twice as better than a human had done for about six months, okay? Just overnight, actually, my students set it up in the plane from Vancouver to Boston. By the time they landed overnight, we saw the data and we already were better than what the humans were picking because the AI is very good at exploring space. So the particular way that we use AI here is actually tell the robot what's the next thing to do. Let me show you the second generation of our robot because obviously that robot was still a toy. This is a little bit better. Now we're mixing colors. A Harvard dealer, I build a robot that mixes drinks. We found that margarita with 10% vinegar is preferred by Russian postdocs. Well, to publish, we cannot mix uh, color, we cannot mix drinks, so we're mixing colors. 
So here is the robot in Vancouver, actually, going around, controlled by Harvard, by the way. So it's going around and then picking up the, the, the color mixture. It doesn't have any idea about the theory of color. Its only goal is to actually match a color, but it doesn't know anything about it. The AI is taking care of it. So this is the same thing that you will do to optimize a reaction. So there it is, uh, doing its best it can uh, to actually dose this thing. So you can imagine the bartending opportunities with our machines. Uh, so it's going to go in there, drop the chemicals. It doesn't have an eye, so it's going to become a cyclops right now. It's going to take a photo, and then it's going to continue. So this is how the laboratories of the future are going to look like. Of course, this is a toy still. It's making, it's making uh, uh, colors, but now we're actually uh, doing molecules. Um, on top of, so for that, actually, I'm going to also make a break a myth. I mean, scientists at the new modern in, 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 you know, university is not a professor in its, in its classroom just sitting there idle. First of all, we the professors want to change the world, right? We want to be multidisciplinary, and we launch companies. So this is Kebotex, OK? I very proudly say that uh, our seed investors were, were from here, from Norway. Some of them are on the audience, OK? So that's one of the reasons I'm here. Uh, but Kebotex is uh, our company that is actually working on this robotization of the chemical laboratory, and we aim it to be the, fir the ke first chemical company of the 21st century, right? We are all about uh, discovery, all about knowledge, all about you know, finding new solutions to the world's problems and not necessarily having big factories and trying to scale up you know, polluting processes. Okay? And also, uh, we just heard from Kausar about quantum computers yesterday. We also need quantum computers. Um, I started my career actually discovering the algorithm that makes quantum computers simulate molecules exactly. Okay? So molecules in a quantum computer can be simulated exactly and not approximately. So if we add quantum computing to the AI and robotics mix in 10 to 15 years from now, when quantum computers are able to do that, we're going to basically change the planet. So half of my group works on robotics and AI, and the other half works on quantum computers. This is just a picture of the IBM Q machine. I, I work with it. I also work with, with Google's machine. Doing a molecular chemistry experiment, the beryllium hydride, this was a nature paper of last year. And it's my favorite paper of the world because my algorithm is employed to actually simulate a molecule. And you can see the superconducting qubits there colored by the molecular orbitals of beryllium hydride. So it's chemistry done with superconducting qubits. Zapata is our company that just launched. The next week is the press release. Uh, we raised $5.4 million to actually make the first w world, uh, make the best software company, maybe better than one qubit. We're competing with those guys over there. So bring it on. Uh, so that's Zapata. And with that, let me just tell you a very amazing example. We were funded by the engine at MIT. That's our big, uh, our main uh, investor for Zapata. And they also founded this company based on a Matthias breakthrough that makes tokamak reactors 65 times smaller, and therefore brings fusion perhaps within reach. So the first issue of the engine publication will talk about our work on quantum computing, but also their work, which I find super exciting, about uh, uh, fusion. And you can see here in the press release, this was enabled by decades and decades of federal government funding for basic research. So let's not forget that the government also plays a role, not only the investors, and that you, we need you because we're in very dark times where the only way to increase science funding is to increase military funding. And with that, I'm going to end with a picture of my research group in the excited state. And thank you.